We're living through what is broadly referred to as the psychedelic renaissance. After 50 years of prohibition, Western society is at long last revisiting where we left off when these substances were made illegal in the 1970s. Drugs like psilocybin from magic mushrooms and MDMA, also known as ecstasy, are now being explored in well over 100 clinical trials around the world, in spite of still being considered drugs of abuse under the law of the land. And these trials are focused on everything from treatment-resistant depression, end-of-life anxiety, substance use disorders, eating disorders, and much more. And the primary modality being explored here is psychedelic-assisted therapy. This is where a patient has a full-blown trip in a clinical setting for six to eight hours, wearing eye shades and headphones alongside two therapists. There are preparatory sessions before the patient consumes the drug and integration sessions after the experience concludes to help people interpret what they've gone through and incorporate those learnings into their lives in a productive way. And the results are encouraging. Psychedelic-assisted therapy is showing great promise, often after just one dosing session. Barring any surprises, U.S. regulatory approval for MDMA-assisted therapy is imminent. Psilocybin's close behind. And Australia recently became the first country in the world to create a legal framework for making both of these drugs available by prescription for particular patients in need. Once again, I am all for this. We need more options. But there's a catch. Consider the size of the problem. Approximately 300 million people struggle with depression globally. Half the world's population can expect to develop a mental disorder at some point in our lifetimes. Will all these people go through a full day, fully immersive psychedelic-assisted therapy experience? Due to the resource-intensive nature of this therapy, estimated costs range from $2,000 all the way up to $20,000 or more per patient, per treatment session. And bear in mind, there's already a six to 12 month wait to see a therapist in this country full stop. It'll be too expensive for some, but too mentally invasive for many others. This is not a small commitment we're talking about here. And people's reactions can be highly variable. Lastly, a number of would-be patients will be contraindicated, meaning the nature of their illness will preclude them from treatment and this won't be an option for them. Bottom line, psychedelic-assisted therapy will not replace the standard of care. One in seven people in this country consume antidepressants. MAOIs, SNRIs, SSRIs. Prescription rates for these drugs have more than doubled in the last decade. They work for some, but they take a long time to kick in come with a myriad of side effects, including loss of libido, weight gain, insomnia, and more. And critically, they haven't been meaningfully improved upon in decades. Do you know what's the fastest growing therapeutic treatment for depression these days? The dissociative drug ketamine. S-ketamine nasal spray, which is the first psychedelic-like drug to come on the market, is already on pace to be a billion-dollar-a-year drug. The medical establishment is growing increasingly comfortable with non-traditional therapeutic treatments for mental illness, which is a great sign, because the current options just won't cut it. So how will psychedelics serve as a starting point? Firstly, psychedelics offer scientists a powerful tool for neural interrogation. These compounds elicit a meaningful response in a range of cellular and behavioral experiments. Publishing on psychedelics used to be career suicide for academics. Now, there's new papers coming out literally every day, exploring how these compounds rewire the brain through neuroplasticity or reopen critical learning periods to therapeutic effect. In short, psychedelics offer a new framework 
for understanding how the brain works. What's more is we will see entirely new drugs inspired by psychedelic drug action. Let me explain. The primary receptor that psychedelics engage with is shown here. This is 5-HT2A. It's a serotonin receptor. And the accepted dogma was that if you activate this receptor, you get hallucinatory effects. But my team has used computational methods to discover new compounds which activate 2A but do not cause hallucinations in animal studies. The moonshot for the company is to develop take-home medications which retain the therapeutic benefits of classic psychedelics but do not require supervised clinical administration. This would be a major breakthrough, and I'm hopeful that it'll lead to the power of psychedelics being made available to a much broader patient population. If you would have told my 17-year-old self that I would see a psychedelic renaissance in my lifetime, I definitely would not have believed you and probably would have hugged a signpost. <laughs> But in June, I went to a psychedelic science conference with over 11,000 attendees. In July, two of these drugs became available by prescription in the country we sit today. These drugs have become destigmatized to the point where I can get on stage and do a TED talk about them for you. Yes, we are at a tipping point with psychedelics. But what's more exciting is that this is the beginning of something new. In the coming years, psychedelics will help uncover mysteries of how the brain works and lead to the discovery of entirely new medicines to treat diseases of the brain. Thank you.